Anne uh, Rückemeyer studied comparative literature, English, um, and history at the university in Tübingen, that is one of these big German old universities, and at Oxford Brookes University at the UK. Is, is that the, uh, uh, a part of the regular Oxford University? No. It's actually it's not. It's in the same neighborhood. Yes, it is in the same neighborhood, but it's a much younger university and it doesn't belong okay. to the University of Oxford, but I think it's one of the best UK modern. Is it excellent? Oh, obviously it is. It must be. It must be. It must be. Um, did you get a library card for Oxford, the real Oxford? Um, no, but I had friends and they got me everything I wanted. <laughs> that's extremely, that's extremely important. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I was a, I was a, a visiting scholar at Harvard uh, at once. And, and that was also a very beautiful library card that everybody wanted to have. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of universities around Cambridge, you know, where people wanted to use, of course, the big library at Harvard and, uh, and they were being kept out, you know, that is a, a very complicated situation. So anyway, we are in Tübingen and in, in Oxford Brookies. Um, so you had a lot of scholarships, I found out, the Gießen Graduate Center of Study uh, of the Study of Culture um, stipend at the University in Gießen. Um, then you did a uh, PhD project on relational autobiographies in contemporary English literatures. So there's this autobiography word that is very important. In 2014, 15, you received a WOPS, that is again a Gießen Career Development Grant. So um, you're the person we have to contact if we want to learn how to, um, how to apply for grants, obviously. And now she's in Freiburg. And before that, she had a junior research group uh, leader position at the university in Heidelberg. That's another beautiful place. Yeah. Um, in 2017, you were uh, you joined uh, a project called List Lit Lists in Literature and Culture, um, and you're um, now a postdoctoral research fellow um, sponsored by Frias. That is that research program um, that is very big in Freiburg. And, you know, after I'm done, you can correct everything I said wrong. Yeah. Um, since, mm -hmm. since 2022, you have a research grant awarded by the German Research Foundation, uh, Deutsche Forschungsgesellschaft, to investigate the poetics of isolation in English literature between the 17th and the 21st century. That's very interesting. And you've um, published um, extensively on the poetics of list making, on life writing, on relationality, on graphic narratives, what my generation called comic strips, and in the field of medical humanities. Um, you've published in uh, prestige like Poetics Today or AB, Autobiography Studies, Journal of Comics and Graphic Novels, and in the European Journal of Life Writing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I, I read you have uh, more um, publications in the making. So uh, anything I said wrong, please. Uh, oops, what's wrong with my video? Here we are. Um, please correct me. No, it's it's all fine. It's just minor things. It's all, all fine. If, um, if you think we have to know something else, please add it. I think in terms of grant writing, it's very important to just dare to do it. So usually we always think, well, this grant is not for me and I'm not the person who should apply. And my suggestion uh -huh. is just do it. Try it. It's a bit just of work. Just do it. But yes, yes. That's Be the main advice. You're encouraging us. Yes. Excellent. That's <laughs> what I wanted to hear. So you just, uh, you know, the floor is yours. You talk as much as you want and you just give me instructions about the slides. Okay, that's great. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, sorry for the problems, but thank you for being here. That's great please. cooperation. I'm very happy that this seems to work. Perfect. Yeah. And if there are any problems um, with acoustics or anything else, um, just tell me immediately. I can, I can hear you. That's good.
Okay. I'm so I'm really happy to see some of you and see that so many of you are participating and we're having this nice uh, meeting across borders. Um, I really like that idea and I want to thank you, Sami, for organizing this. Um, it's very nice and it's an impressive range of different kinds of um, lectures and speeches. Um, and we have um, one or two breaks in between. And if you have questions, um, you are welcome to ask even when we have our break time. You do not have to wait until the last sentence is spoken. Oh, that's good. I interrupt sometimes. I'm terrible. Oh, I see. Okay, so do it. So this will keep it more happy <laughs> because there might be some passages that are rather long and then it might really help if you just interrupt and we start talking. That will be nice. Okay, um, so today I want to introduce you kind of to my um, latest um, research project. Um, and um, also to a not so famous Victorian writer, and that's um, Harriet Martineau. Um, if you will be sitting in a room by now, I would ask you who knows her and who doesn't, because I even have colleagues who worked in English studies for a long time and said, Harriet Martineau, who is that? Never heard of her. Mm -hmm. So she, she is not um, Jane Austen and she's also not George Eliot, but she exists. Um, and we will talk about her and also about isolation, because I think um, we are still in this process of thinking about what happened to us during these um, COVID pandemic times, or I'm thinking about this. And I'm looking at English literature and want to know what is isolation? How did others experience isolation? Um, what kind of text did they produce? What forms did they use to pro um, to express isolation? And this will be what we do today. So look at um, Harriet Martineau. Na Excuse me. Um, please. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Happens to me so all the time. So I should be with the babysitter, but somehow, um, should work. We know. Okay. So I'm not isolated, but sometimes I wish to be isolated, and this is very typical, I think, for female writing. And we will talk about this tension today. Um to be afraid of being in confinement if you want to go out, but you can't go out. But there's also the other side, especially in 19th century text, where women want to be alone and they want to find the time to write and they want to find the time to, well, do lectures and not be disturbed. But sometimes it's difficult to find isolation. So isolation is an ambivalent experience. Um, it can be enjoyed and it can also be, well, feared and hated and make you depressed and more depressed, yeah, and crazy. Okay, um, yeah, I started to, um, well, approach this work on isolation and also as part of it on Harriet Martineau um, when we were in the COVID pandemic and we were um, forced into home office and into homeschooling and into, um, well, Tailor teaching. And I don't know how this experience has been for you, but I personally truly enjoyed the first weeks of the lockdown light in spring 2020. Suddenly there was time to do things that I had long been waiting to do, to have time to do. As Harriet Martineau articulates it in her autobiography, and here we need the third slide. Thank you. And this has changed a little bit, but maybe you can read it, but I will read out the, um, the quote. While I was in health, there was always so much to do that was immediately wanted that as usually happens in such cases, that which was not immediately necessary was deferred. And this is also my experience of the first week of the lockdown light. There were less appointments, there were no more time to read books, there were more time to go for a walk, more time for cooking, healthy eating, doing handicrafts with children, sometimes maybe too much. So, and this can be exhausting too. But there was time to do things that for a long time you hadn't any time for. And this is maybe one of the typical um, facets of isolation. Soon, however, I began to notice changes that actually worried me. Spending most of the time at home, avoiding face-to-face -face contact, avoiding touch, spending more and more time on screens, it became clear that isolation is a truly ambivalent situation. 
Moreover, I noticed that discourses of isolation were not only part of my private conversations with friends and neighbors, but with increasing vigor also took shape in political and social fields, and not only in those related to the measures connected to COVID-19. Ironically, while we had to suffer from worldwide pandemic, which actually demonstrated that we are a very networked society and everything is actually um, connected, we simultaneously experienced shutdowns, lockdowns, the abrupt ending of international travel, and then in between also the Brexit. Maybe it was due to the fact that I grew up in the 90s and you could go everywhere with Erasmus Mundus. So all students went to some European country and I think they still do, but it's difficult to go to England now. So I grew up in the 90s and it seemed that the world is just open and totally network and it gets, it gets more so every day. Um, and then I experienced the Brexit and the stop of air travel and um, all these lockdowns. Um, it was really like, I felt that the world is totally changing. It was, um, yeah, a bit as if my older worldview collapsed and I have to think about what happens in isolation. Due to increasing digital communication, and now we need the um, number four. Okay. Global markets and mobility options that allow us to uh, well, work in international environments, to do international shopping, to do a lot of tourism and travel anytime. The buzzword of the 90s, I think, um, and also of the first decades of the new millennium was network. And also scholarly discourse is very often um, centered on networks. So, Sammy, we need the next one. There seemed to be nothing more remote in Western industry nations than to think about the rather marginal thematic complex of isolation, I thought. Yet, the network-oriented globalization narrative has been countered by an increasing number of maybe more silent voices from psychology and neuroscience even before COVID-19. They pointed out that the hyper-connected digital age does not lead to closer connectedness, but rather to increasing isolation and loneliness. And even before the pandemic, social isolation was described as the growing epidemic of the 21st century. This is possibly one of the reasons why Theresa May launched the UK's first loneliness strategy in 2018. And now we need the next slide. In 2019, Robert D. Newman, president of the National Humanities Center, wrote in the Los Angeles Review of Books, while the antidote to the age of loneliness is not easily conjured, it needs a political as well as scientific response. That is, it will need the lessons that we learn through the humanities. And maybe this was my trigger to start my project, to put my personal musings um, well into a research project. What is the lesson, I thought, that I learned from my field of the humanities? What is the lesson that we can learn from English literature? And before we will now zoom in on Harriet Martineau, allow me to first go a little bit deeper and have an excursion that brings us to the central and also marginal features of the ambivalent phenomenon of isolation. The next slide. Obviously, isolation is by no means tied to pandemic contexts, but a central and recurring anthropological experience, and therefore also a recurring theme in British literature. Um, so if you start to brainstorm different texts that you have read, maybe in English studies and seminars, some of you might have come across um, Robinson Crusoe, who is on his island, and is definitely isolated. Um, you might have come across um, Conrad Kurtz, um, who, well, travels the Congo and is isolated from the European continent, um, and also from friends and family, um, and actually changes. Um, you might know Mrs. Havisham from Dickens' Great Expectations, a very 
um, strange and shrewd old lady who also lives in isolation. And the message with Dickens seems to be that because she is isolated, she has changed. Or you might have read um, Lord of the Flies or other kinds of youth um, novels or young adult novels where um, groups actually are isolated on an island and they might have a social order in the beginning, but um, a lot of things um, change and worsen. And um, what we take for granted actually is not taken for granted anymore. So the message in many texts is if um, people are isolated, they also change for the worse um, because they, well, they lose connection to to ethics, morals, rules. Um, yeah, that's good for them. Mm, but of course, there are also um, these other examples. So I mentioned um, Daniel Defoe, um, who needs this island um, to actually see what he can do. So he he is an he's an entrepreneur. He has many ideas. He's totally self sufficient. He is this autonomous individual who can do anything. Or we have people in American literature like um, um, Thoreau, who goes um, to the woods and wants to live deliberately and really enjoys this to be um, far away from civilization and thinks that this is the real life. So there we have all these ambivalences of isolation and a lot of texts um, that, well, negotiate that. You might even think of romantic poetry. I think, yeah, it's it's really not difficult to write a literary history of isolation because it's, it's always there, kind of. Okay, um, but to we see there are so many different phenomena of isolation. So now it is necessary that we have an idea of maybe different subgroups or, um, well, start to define the term. And so we need the next transparency. Okay, so this selection of random examples from British literature does already demonstrate that scenarios of isolation include the happy desire to be alone and the nightmarish realization that one is closed in, in is cap capably bound to a space of confinement. What will be necessary is a modeling of isolation scenarios that allows us to relate, but also to differentiate the term isolation from similar phenomena, such as solitude and loneliness, imprisonment and retreat. Solitude has been defined by philosophy as a basically neutral state that people seek and even enjoy for a variety of reasons, while loneliness basically denotes a feeling of emotional deficiency. A feeling, as a feeling loneliness is by no means bound to the state of being physically alone. So you can sit in a lecture hall with lots of other students who just started to study and came to university, but you might be very lonely because you do not know anybody. But for solitude, you actually need to be alone, usually. There, there can't be any other people around you. It's associated with spatial withdrawal, even wilderness, and the pursuit of independence and freedom. With regard to imprisonment, um, well, solitude and loneliness represent important varieties of isolation. However, they by no means exhaust the range of situations, motivations, and manifestations that would be sufficient for an examination of this ambivalent concept because isolation also marks a component of involuntary separation or an other imposed aloneness. So confinement is um, one of these things that are other imposed that are not chosen by you. You do not want to be alone. Um, so you might be um, have to be alone, though you do not want to be if you have to go to prison, but also if you are exiled and not part of a community. Um, a further variation that must therefore be taken into consideration um, is confinement in the sense of imprisonment, but also I think exile um, as a form of exclusion or also other forms of exclusion. Um, the last one um, of these four subgroups that I want to talk about today is retreat. And I'm um, actually presenting these different subgroups because I think in this ambivalent um, well, relationship to isolation that we find in Harriet Martineau's texts, um, we find 
a lot of these different subgroups. We find solitude, we find confinement, we find retreat. So it's important to know what we are talking about. Retreat is the fourth component of isolation, and it is usually connected to retreat into privacy. Retreat from the Anglo-Norman regret designates the retreat from battle, especially after being wounded by the enemy. Retreat stands for refuge or shelter and the escape from difficult or dangerous situations. Retreat also has great overlap with the term privacy, um, defined as the right to be alone, only in 1890, but I think the feeling that what privacy might be was around when Harriet Martineau wrote her texts. And um, this right to be alone was, as we mentioned several times today, especially difficult um, to claim for women, at least in the 19th century. And we could argue if you look back at this um, COVID-19 um, pandemic and its consequences even today, because those um, who stayed at home and stopped to go to work were usually in most families that I know of. And I think this is also what sociological studies um, by now show. Um, these were the women. So it's still more difficult for women to um, claim their own time and their own spaces and their own activities, at least in Germany. To sum up, a focus on isolation makes it possible to bring together the practices as well as the emotion, em, emotional states and the motivations behind the respective concepts. And that's to relate the tension between closeness and distance, contact and isolation, opening and exclusion to one another, and thus to illuminate their complex interconnectedness. An examination of literary isolation scenarios from the last four centuries offers important insights into this not or often not self-chosen, both spatially and socially or pathologically experienced condition. Okay, so I drink some water and you can maybe brainstorm and think about other texts that you know where isolation is an important topic. And then we continue with some theory and um, yeah, you need to be refreshed for this. If there are any questions already, um, you are welcome to ask them. Otherwise, we go on. Oh, I can't hear you, Samuel. I just wanted to say I, I, I like your square, you know, with a kind of negative part of loneliness and the more positive solitude, you know, because the retreat definitely is safety and is something extremely positive. So this is how you organize your left side and your right side on the mm -hmm. in, 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 in the square. And the retreat is, is that's, I mean, that's basically the Virginia Woolf argument, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> A room of one's own. And we will come back to this today. Yeah. yeah exactly. Okay, good. Sorry. You go on. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, yeah, some of you might know when they see him who, who this guy is. Um, this is um, Michel Foucault, and he is important for my project because he, um, well, you can't say invented, but maybe he became aware of things that he called um, heterotopia. And um, different um, theories that deal with with um, space and the sociology of space and um, what takes place and what kind of rooms and how do different geographies actually, um, well, how are they connected to processes of isolation? Um, this is important for my project, but one of the concepts that I wanted to um, share with you, because it might be important also in your further studies, is the idea of heterotopia. Um, so um, Foucault says that heterotopias are places that exist as an ordinary part of society, but which are also in some way um, separate or marginal. 
Um, so this is just one of the different um, subgroups of heterotopia that he may mentions. But you can, for example, imagine a hospital. So it's kind of a world um, in its own. They have another rhythm. There is not really day and night because the light um, always is on and they have shifts and it just goes on. So they are part of the society, but they are also kind of a marginal place. So if you are, or well, it is it is part of our society, but it is also a universe in, its, in itself because if you are not sick or if you do not work there, you usually do not go there. And it has different rhythms and different time structures and um, maybe also different hierarchies. Um, and another example would, for example, be um, border schools, cemeteries, museums, because they try to um, well have a very dense time structure and um, a lot of things that happened in many different centuries um, have some simultaneous, some, you, you can experience them simultaneously in a museum. Um, but one of these heterotopia um, that um, I want to um, talk about today is also the sick room. But you can say that most places of isolation um, or many of them um, actually also present as a heterotopus because um, the prison, for example, is one. So these are very often places that are um, at the margins of our usual everyday life, but are still um, perform very important functions and are part of our everyday life. Okay. Um, so even Crusoe's Island could be thought of as um, a hototopia. And it's important to keep it in mind that I will later on discuss Martino's sick room as heterotopia. Okay, now we can use the next one. Next Oops. transparency. It's not going down. Ah. Now it is. Okay. Yes, there is a room of one's own. Um, as I mentioned already several times, of course, gender studies is also a very um, important source if you want to think about isolation. Um, so women are the recluse and, um, you know, um, this work by Charlotte Bronte, um, the Met, no, um, about Jane Eyre. And then there was a theory written about it and it's called the Mad Woman in the Attic. So um, there is a lot of psychological theory behind this. But it's important to keep in mind that throughout the 19th century, women are very often the ones who are imprisoned because they are different. And this is why gender studies is a very important way to think about isolation. And this starts, um, well, in the Middle Ages, but probably even in antiquity. And in the 19th century, um, it's very important to discuss Gothic fiction, that um, women are always the imprisoned ones, very often um, also because they are different. And then Virginia Woolf at the beginning of the 20th century makes there's a very important point from the other side that actually women need this room of their own to be productive, to be great writers, to be creative, to have time to think and a room where they are undisturbed. Um, so gender studies is important if you think about isolation, especially female isolation. Um, the next um, theoretical input I draw on, um, Samuel. Is the next transparency coming up? Okay, doesn't ah okay. It's um, narrative medicine and disability studies. Um, of course, there are many um, different um, well aspects you can think of. Of course, you go to a specific area, especially if you, if people are afraid that you might um, infect them. Um, we we had lockdown of houses um, in Spain. Um, that reminded all of us of Defoe's um, Journal of the Plague Year. Um, so to be ill or to be sick very often is connected to scenarios of isolation. But as Arthur Frank um, said in The Wounded Storyteller, of course, it's always said when a person becomes a patient, physicians take over her body and the understanding of the body. And this kind of separates this person from the rest of her life. So you are isolated from your past where you have been a healthy person because now you are kind of, well, in the imprisonment, you are confined, you are now seen as this sick person. And very often sickness, um, chronic illness um, 
these things are very often connected to scenarios where you are separated from your family because you have to go to retreat or you have to go to a specific hospital. Um, and there are also a lot of illnesses that are very much stigmatized. And this is, of course, also a scenario of isolation because you there are people who have prejudices against you. And this is why you do not belong to specific groups or why you do not feel welcome. Um, so this whole area of disability studies and narrative medicine um, has very important sources that you need to look at literature that is about isolation, especially isolation because of illness. And the last um, theory that I use, and that is even important um, to think about Harriet Martineau, is island studies. Um, if you think of an island, it's usually a geological or a geographical entity. And this is, of course, also important. If we think about the Brexit, I think it's not a coincidence um, that these thoughts, well, maybe first originated in um, Great Britain because, well, they are in Ireland and maybe less somewhere in Italy, though they have them now too, because they are included in the continent. So islands um, very often have another idea of themselves, maybe. And island is also a very important metaphor. Um, so you find it in John Donne's devotions upon emergent locations, no man is an island, um, where they um, very much highlight this relationality, that people are not autonomous. So who would I be without the bus driver who brings me somewhere? And who would I be without um, teachers who teach my children? Um, so you are not actually this autonomous, great entrepreneur um, that Robinson Crusoe presents, but we are very much dependent. And this is one of the messages also in island studies, because they think about, well, this looks like an island, what you see on the cover of this book. But if you take the water away and you see what is underneath, you see that all the land is connected. It's just that sometimes um, you need a ship to go over the water, but um, under the water or under the sea level, um, everything is connected. And this is um, from source to think about isolation. What different ways people actually find to overcome their isolation because they realize, well, it seems like there are the walls of the sick room that separate me from the others, but actually there can be other ways to find connections. Um, so these, um, yeah, what seems to be separate is very often still a whole. And when there are borders and um, other kinds of um, walls, these can be overcome and people are very creative, um, as you will find when you look at English literature, um, well, what kind of ideas they have. Okay, so this is the fourth important um, theoretical input, and there are a lot of important books, but I thought um, this will just give you a very broad idea on the different theoretical fields that I draw on um, to define my idea of isolation and also to have different theoretical texts that can be very fruitfully discussed in dialogue with my primary texts. And one of the primary texts that we want to talk about um, today, because we have a focus on 19th century um, women literature or Victorian literature, I don't know, um, is Harriet Martineau. Okay, thank you. Um, one of her patrons called her the little deaf woman from Norwich, a description that is actually very misleading, as you will see in a moment. Martineau's texts are of interest because they allow for a dense intersection of various aspects of isolation. She was a woman and a writer in the 19th century. She was deaf. She had to live in the sick room for five years and she found retreat in traveling the world. Her form of refuge from the constant demands of the everyday and the crowded spheres of Victorian homes where privacy or privacy was a rare asset. I am particularly interested in Martineau's autobiographical texts on illness, which shed light on her lifelong impairment due to progressive deafness and phases of gynecological disease. By self-reflexively processing her experience of illness in her own research, so she is called the first sociologist or the first female sociologist, um, and as developing a first sociological theory of disability, shame 
and stigma. So these are all things that she wrote about as a sociologist, but also as somebody who experienced or had experienced these things. Martineau shows the extent to which social isolation grows out of the consciousness of being flawed. And this is a very important stigma theory because you feel that you are flawed, but there's something not okay with you. You feel excluded and then you can you actually are excluded. And sometimes it's in another order so that you first are excluded and then you feel there's something wrong with you. But this um, principle that um, um, social isolation very often um, relies on this notion that somebody um, feels being flawed is important and um, has been expressed in the letters to the deaf by Martineau. In her autobiographical text, Life in the Sick Room, shame and excessive demands, withdrawal and recreation and networking and literary activity become visible as constantly interacting components of illness-related isolation. I will explore the diverse intersections of the ambivalent forms of isolation in the complicated relationship between the private and the public in Harriet Martineau's writings. And some of you might have read the um, text that I provided for today's lecture. And this is very much um, about this, these metaphors of um, opening and closing and about um, speciality as well. Um, Martineau experienced isolation also on the grounds of gender in her role as a female writer because of her disability and her illness. But, and this is one way of her ways to overcome the stigmatization of her deafness and the confinement of her illness, she deliberately made her sufferings public in a variety of forms, some addressed to her fellow sufferers, so to share the experience, and the other addressed to the healthy public to actually educate them. So she's a very brave woman in the sense that she, you could say that she suffered from a lot of things and she just could have been very sad and maybe go into isolation and don't talk about it, but she writes about everything and she addresses everything. Um, she addresses her role as a female writer, she addresses her role as a person with a disability, and um, she sees her role very much as not only gaining support, and comfort others who suffer from similar um, conditions, like being female. But um, she also wants to educate the public because she she has this feeling that people sometimes just don't know how it is to be deaf and don't know how they should behave. And so she she's a very interesting woman because she combines these autobiographical experiences um, with her sociological work. And this makes her um, a great example, I think. Although I'm particularly interested in Martineau's autobiographical work, um, her autobiography was published only after her death in 1870, and her book Life in the Sick Room from 1844, we should keep in mind that Martineau was also a journalist, a travel writer, a novelist, a writer of children's books, and also an activist for the abolition of slavery and for the rights of women and for the rights of deaf people and much, much more. Um, Maybe we need the next slide, I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine, good. Harriet Martineau was born in Norwich in 82. Her father had a business in the textile industry. She received a proper education. From early childhood onwards, she was extremely sensitive, timid, often ill, and experienced various social discomforts on account of her hearing, of her bad hearing. In her autobiography, Martineau um, describes herself as a delicate child that suffered from long years of indigestion by day and nightmares and terrors at night, which she attributed to a beggarly nervous system. Susan Hacke Dristel, one of Martineau's many biographers, states, confused and somewhat rebellious over both the family's treatment of her and the middle-class expectations imposed on her, the young Harriet found sanctuary in books and ideas. Her voracious reading and her early attraction to writing may be seen in part as compensation for the frustrations arising from her personal relationships. And this is something that we will observe again and again. So she had a certain kind of relationships, but um, very, very much he also loved this form of retreat to be alone and to manage her relationships. So not to see too many people on a day. She was very much into writing letters 
writing books and um, observing people. So the sociologists. And we need the next transparency. Okay. Despite all the physical and social challenges, Martino is what we could call today a resilient personality. Her life changed radically when after the death of her father in 1826, the family business gradually failed. Martino later described the situation that others would consider a calamity as a liberation, an event that freed her from the confines of the home and gave her scope for action. She writes, the deep felt sense of progress and expansion was delightful. And so was the exertion of all my faculties and not least that of will to overcome my obstructions and force my way to that power of public speech of which I believed myself more or less worthy. So I think there was um, an engagement and somebody who wanted to marry her, but um, this didn't work out fine. And so for her, the death of her father and the breakdown of the family business was really um, embraced as her chance to become a writer. Martino had written little pieces on female education for a Unitarian journal. And after her father's death and the failure of the family business, she started to support herself through writing. She moved to relatives in London, took a job as a copy editor and worked on her nine volume work illustrations of political economy and this appeared in 1832 and aimed to explain principles of production and consumption in a generally understandable language so she is always this educated she loves to um, share her insights with the public and this book was a huge success um, and actually gave her some money to rely on um, she it brought her literary celebrity and financial independence the observations, conversations and insights she gains during her trips to the States then can be found in her two books, Society of America and How to Observe Morals and Manners, two publications that would later establish her as one of the first sociologists. Um, so, and we should not forget that she is um, a woman in the 19th century and she is also kind of deaf by then, so she can't hear a lot anymore, um, but she travels America and writes about it very successfully. Um, I think we need the next transparency. Space. Yes. Martineau soon realized that the public exposition of her life and views left her, as she put it into autobiography, remarkably open to the world. You could also say very vulnerable. As a woman, she was especially vulnerable to the prying outside world. The tension between public and private, the social confinement related to Victorian gender roles on the one hand, and the vulnerability that was implied by leaving the private realm towards the open public, because she started to write, um, is woven into her language, and in particular highlighted in her spatial metaphors. And this is what this um, article that I suggested for you to read is about, about these spatial metaphors, which are very um, interesting in Martino's work. She says about her early days as a writer that she was outgrowing her shell. And they thought, OK, um, should we have the picture of a turquoise or um, I should, I've chosen a picture of this um, little chick um, that is still a little bit um, in this eggshell, but is um, actually outgrowing it. Um, until she could cast it off. So this one hasn't yet. Choosing this metaphor, she presents domestic life as confining and enclosing. She wants to get out of it, but it is her protection. Through the image of the shell, Martineau addresses the ambivalences of the private sphere, which stand for protection, yet also represent the dangers of confinement. Her career in writing is her way to burst open and tear this confining wall. In her autobiography, she describes her career in spatial terms as well. When offered a job correcting proofs, she writes that she rejoiced unspeakably in this opening and writes of the wonderful scenes which life was now opening to her. So the career writing to be a writer is opening the usual sphere of the Victorian woman. 
Publishing books was a dangerous business for women, and entering the public sphere made Martineau extremely vulnerable to public criticism. Her illustrations of political economy were very popular, but still some reviewers characterize them as beyond the scope of a young woman whose proper purview is the domestic sphere. And she later refrains from defending herself against an infamous review because she knows that, the, that this would, quote, close her career. Um, and somewhere we need the transparency before this one, um, because we are still between leaving one's shell and standing in front of closed doors. Um, so these are very two important um, metaphors in her writing. The review, by the way, was published by the Quarterly Review and written by some John Wilston Crocker, a man who deliberately set out to, quote, tomahawk um, her. These were his words. The young female writer, he wanted to tomahawk her as a means to establish his own journalistic career and sent the young lady back into her proper sphere. Again, the image of entering and closing conjures up a privileged space into which people may be allowed and from which they may subsequently be excluded. There is an overt connection between Martino's sense of metaphysical, no, metaphorical space opening before her and the necessity forced on her to negotiate public space in ways that did not shut down possibilities for her. So she had to use these possibilities, but she had to be very careful. So she couldn't have a, a fight or um, maybe a contrary or a counter review. She had to be very careful there. Obviously, a shell of both protecting and limiting. Since Martineau had left the domestics we are to write for the public, she was perceived by some as a feminine transgressor. The domestic ideal, we should not forget, was central to the division between private and public spheres and might very well be seen as presenting one of the most stabilizing ideologies of the Victorian era. Okay, next slide. After Martineau escaped the confining domestic sphere through the publication of her writings and the subsequent financial independence, she did not only experience freedom, but also experienced a new desire for refuge and retreat. Because now everybody knew her, everybody wanted to meet her, visitors came, people wanted her to write new books. Um, so now she was in this open sphere, but what she wanted now was retreat. This time, not only from her pirate, private obligations, but also from public exposure. Martineau had learned to use opportunities for retreats during the peak of hours of the day. And this is, I think, what women and maybe also parents and maybe also men, I don't know, still do. So you go to the margins, not of society, but to the margins of the day. You work in the early mornings and you work in the late evenings. And this is what she writes about. If ever I shut myself into my own room for an hour of solitude, I knew it was at the risk of being sent for the join the sewing circle or to read aloud. I being the reader on account of my growing deafness. But I want time for what my heart was set upon nevertheless, either in the early morning or late at night. So um, this brings us maybe to the idea that um, heterotopia is not connected to a different space, but sometimes can also um, refer to other temporalities. So you do not only go to other spaces to have isolation, you can also go to other time spheres. But after outgrowing her shell and entering the open world, the refuge she longs for is not merely for an enclosed space or a retreat in a room, um, that might allow her isolation and solitude. Her longing for retreat also presents as a desire to escape from the defined and demarcated female life put before her. And this means that she has a very clever idea. Her kind of retreat is to go and travel. This retreat through traveling, I have termed this form of self-chosen isolation as aloofness. Not only because her strongly developed sense of distance or detachment from even her closest friends and relatives that many autobi no, many biographers describe, 
Um, but also because a loof or, or, mm, originating from the Dutch word loof etymologically means windwards or facing the wind. The expression was originally used in nautical orders to keep the ship's hat to the wind and thus to stay clear of a lee shore or some other quarter. The noun aloofness thus expresses both, a retreat in the sense of staying clear from a lee shore, which I translate as staying clear from the coast of Victorian conventions, but not in the form of isolating oneself in enclosed spaces, as for example, Virginia Woolf has them in a room of one's own, but to venture out into the open sea. Aloofness thus originally means to keep your distance, not by entrenching yourself in a cave, but by retreating to the open sea. And this is what Martino does through her travels. But um, there um, is a hindrance. She can't go on travel because she gets sick. It was on one of her trips, this time through Italy in 1839, when Martineau fell seriously ill. She returned to England and her brother-in-law, a respected physician, diagnosed her with a prolapse of the uterus and polypus tumors. After surgical removement, medication and initial treatment, her brother-in-law predicted that she would live only a few more years. This is when Martineau decided to leave her sister's family in Newcastle and to retreat to the northeastern coastal town, Tynemouth. Next transparency. Okay, I think some things are missing on this transparency, but what, what you can see here is where is Tynemouth, um, where she took her illness retreat, and also the cover um, of the wait, most sold version or edition of Life in the Sick Room. Martineau later writes in Life in the Sick Room, I cannot but wish that more consideration was given to the comfort of being alone in illness. Because usually ill people, um, well, they actually stayed in the household of family. But she had the financial means to actually have her own household. And she thinks it's very important for sick people to have the chance to be alone and not disturbed. We, those who suffer from long-term or chronic illness, find it best and happiest to admit our friends only in the easiest hours when we can enjoy their society and feel ourselves least of a burden. And it is indispensable for our peace of mind to be alone when in pain. This illness is again an ambivalent experience, of course. Martineau says that she felt comparatively happy in her release from responsibility, anxiety and suspense. And this is maybe what some of us experience when we have a positive um, COVID-19 test. Um, okay, this will be maybe, well, be connected to a lot of pain and fatigue. Um, but you can, you are not responsible for some of the usual responsibilities for some time. And this is what she enjoyed about her illness. Um, yet she constantly refers to her sickness as an imprisonment. And in her self-written obituary, she calls herself a prisoner to the couch. And I think this is also what this um, title page of the usual edition of Life in the Sick Room very well um, brings across. Within the Victorian public, circulated lots of speculations on the cause of her illness, which picked up speed again due to the usual retreat, the unusual retreat at Tynemouth. So why does she not stay with her family if she's ill? How can she live on her own? Olive Banks in the Biographical Dictionary of British Feminists speculates that it might have been, quote, an unconscious attempt on her part to evade family responsibilities, particularly for her mother. Her mother had turned blind and Martineau was said to be very exhausted from taking care of her. Another biographer, Robert K. Webb in Harriet Martineau, a radical Victorian, states that Mrs. Martineau was really ill. Her invalidism was not simply hysteria or hypochondria. Um, or an excuse to escape, however much of all of them may have entered into the situation. And what you can see here is that in the 19th century, if a woman gets ill, the idea that this must be connected to, to um, hysteria, especially if it's connected to some illness of the uterus, is never far away. So this is always the first pattern of explanation. 
What also becomes clear, however, is um, that it's important to know that in this era of industrialization, the idea of overwork and exhaustion fostered um, the medical understanding of possible interrelation between too much physical work that might actually lead to a problem with health conditions. And this is because um, this was also a diagnose um, that came up in connection to factory workers um, that people found out um, that overwork is something that can make you ill. Um, it's a discourse in this time. Okay, the sick room. She does not just go there, but she shapes the space. She has to live in. When Martino moved to Tynemouth, she was convinced of her incurability and expected to die before she would ever leave her sick room again. Although she must have experienced a lot of pain, as becomes clear by the fact that she was medicated with opium, Martino started to actively shape her sick room, or as she calls it, her prison walls. She decorated her room with flowers, plants, and her favorite paintings and books, and made frequent use of a telescope a friend gave her to take in the view from a window overlooking the valley below. We need the next transparency. So it's very nice to live close to the sea if you ever have to spend a lot of time in the sick room. Keep in mind. In Life in the Sick Room, she explains, when an invalid is under sentence of disease for life, it becomes a duty of first-rate importance to select a proper place of abode, of a boat. This is often overlooked, and a sick prisoner goes on to live where he lived before for no other reason than because he lived there before. So she is fighting for the rights of the sick. She adds that the sick person or the sick prisoner should have an opportunity to overlook fields or even the sea. We should have the widest expanse of sky for night scenery. We should have a wide expanse of land or water for the sake of a sense of liberty. There can be nothing in inland scenery which can give the sense of life and notion and connection with the world like sea changes. It becomes clear that Martineau attempted to create a positive environment in which to think, write and visit with others. The room is thus a testimony of a social and intellectual networks. And this is what I think is um, the basic message about how Martino shapes her sick room. Hers is a networked isolation and how she um, succeeds um, to create this networked um, isolation that she actually likes very much um, because she has agency. She can determine how much isolation and how much network she wants um, will be um, the focus of the next um, minutes. But you were welcome to breathe in and stretch because now we'll look at a lot of um, text passages. Martineau aims to make her readers understand the subjective experience of illness. Her writing work as an act of translation between the private and the public as hers is not only a memoir but also a treatise that aims to instruct healthy readers on how to understand, feel with and deal with the invalid. So this is a pattern with her. Whenever she has a certain autobiographical experience, she's not just, well, showing her soul and writing about her feelings, but she always takes on this role of the educator. Okay, now listen to me. I know how it is um, to be deaf. I know how it is um, to have a disability. I know how it is to be in a sick room. And then she writes for the public to educate and um, to, well, yeah, to um, help find better ways to cope with it and create better environments to make this experience as enjoyable as possible. Marev Rawley characterizes all of Martineau's writing, no matter if about political economy, America or the sick room, as determined by a drive to popularize and thereby educate. Martineau said about life in the sick room, it seems that my business is to suffer for other people's information, to be a sort of pioneer in the regions of pain, to make the way somewhat easier or at least more direct to those who come after. Yet Martineau shares her story not only to inform and educate the public, 
but also to create a bond between those who suffer. The book was first written by an invalid anonymously, and Martineau frequently addresses her unknown comrades and suffering. Yet, as her earlier letters to the deaf, also life to the sick room, is addressed to her fellow sufferers, already in the preface, when she quotes Shakespeare's King Lear, does she stress the comforts of fellowship. When we are better see bearing our woes, we scarcely think our motheries are false. Who alone suffers, suffers most in the mind, leaving free things and happy shows behind. For then the mind much sufferance doth o'er skip when grief hath mates and bearing fellowship. She further attributes specific meaning to suffering and claims that a particular form of knowledge or wisdom is shared among fellow sufferers. She speaks of the invalid's privileged access to inner worlds and argues that along our prison walls, the sick have a higher understanding of history as they do not take part in it. And this is connected to the Victorian tradition of sage writing. Um, so you always have those who are aloof, who are isolated, who have a distanced perspective on society um, can produce these writings full of wisdom. Moreover, Martineau dedicated her book to one specific fellow sufferer whom she never mentions, whose name is never given. So some have speculated um, that this might actually be Elizabeth Bennett Browning, um, but I think it's not really clear, but it might very well be. So there is a dedicatee, a sister in arms to whom she addresses her book. We need the next transparency. Yes. Have you got it? Mm, not yet. No. It's not coming? Mm, yes. Now we have it. Sorry. It took so long. Okay. <laughs> so this is one of these strategies um, to arrive at a networked isolation. That she imagines that she's not just writing a book for the public and thus makes herself very vulnerable. But no, it's like writing a letter, a very long letter, a book to this one specific person who actually knows what suffering is like. This is how she frames it. Um, in the uh, preface, she says, I have felt that if I spoke of these things at all, it must be to some fellow sufferer, to someone who had attained these experiences before me or with me, and having you for my companion throughout, however unconsciously to yourself, I have uttered many things that I could hardly otherwise have spoken, for one may speak for more feeble with a far more feeble with a friend, no far more freely with a friend, um, though in the hearing of others, than when singly addressing a number. Most frequently, however, I have forgotten that others could hear and converse with you alone. So what becomes clear is that this other person, and it might be the bit Bernard Browning even does not know that she is the one who is addressed. She is just in Martineau's mind. She imagines this other fellow sufferer and she has a specific person in mind, it seems, but it's not that she ever tells her, this is my book, I wrote it for you. Um, but she has somebody whom she imagines she writes for and this makes her less vulnerable because this person knows what sickness is about. Why does Martineau create this narrative situation? maybe because it allows her to say things which she otherwise would never have said in a public context, maybe to create a protective shell in the staged conversation with a friend, or maybe because it was considered indecent to publicly talk or write about the privacies of the sick room. And this is true. In their shared experience of illness, one becomes for the other a silent witness of the pain which had better not be mentioned in public. Pain was seen as a blessing, albeit in disguise. Dougal Stewart, a Scottish moral philosopher, in The Philosophy of the Active and Moral Powers of Man in 1828, implied that expressing one's physical agony was impolite, even boorish. He instructed people in pain to remember that all violent expressions of pain were undoubtedly offensive and good breeding dictates that they should be restrained. And as Martino does not follow this advice, um, she has to have a very specific narrative frame 
to protect herself. The adequacy of the dedication becomes a confidant. The scenario for allows, allows for an implied articulation of insider experiences, which are not publicly revealed here, but which do still resonate as a kind of shared distinction that allows Martino to forge a community of knowing insiders. And here we need the next transparency. Here we go. Is it coming slowly? Yes. And this is just how I wanted to show you how she forms this community and how she use um, construct this anaphoric um, sentence constructions um, to make this very clear that she shares a certain kind of knowledge with this other person, her fellow sufferer and many other fellow sufferers that all of us who are not in this experience of illness um, should not judge her book and should not think that we know how it is. You know, doubtless, as well as I, the emptiness of the consolation when our pitying friends in all love and sincerity remind us of what we did by our efforts when we were still well and active, and what we are doing still for the world by preserving a decent quietness in the midst of our troubles. You know, as well as I, how withering would be the sense of our own nothingness if we tried to take comfort from our own dignity and usefulness. You know, as well as I, how very far we can see from our place on the verge of life. So say writing again. You know, as I do, how useful it is to human beings to have before their eyes spectacles of all experiences. You and I and our fellow sufferers see differently, whether or not we see further. The effects of these lines are twofold. On the one hand, they help Martino to form an accomplice who seemingly shares and confirms her wisdom on display in this passage. On the other hand, the staged and intimate conversation allows her to express a pointed criticism on the empty words and opinions of her pitying friends. Martino praises the comfort of the companionship and the walls of the sick room become porous when she starts to verbally visualize the strong bonds that she feels to connect the two ill persons in their individual sick rooms. And this is when she imagines that there might be angels going between these different sick rooms and communicate between them and um, create a bond between them. Yes, this is, I think, the first quote you see here. Individual and isolating illness thus appears as if it was jointly experienced. Moreover, Martino claims to feel less abundant and less alone because the other already knows what she is going through. As a consequence, she bestows meaning and purpose on the suffering of the other because she says, because I know that you suffer, it's easier for me. And vice versa, also her suffering is not in vain because she can write this book and thereby lighten the lot of her companions. So um, finding meaning, finding a purpose, why suffering has to be endured is of course always an important strategy um, to, well, um, create or have some resilience, some resilience. The whole book is truly a conversation with you, she writes to her dedicate. I shall not direct it to your hands, but trust to human sympathy to bring these words under your eyes to soften your couch, shame, and banish your foes of depression and pain, and set your chamber in holy order and something of cheerful adornment. I may have the honor of being your nurse, though I am myself laid low. Through hundreds of miles are between us, though hundreds of miles are between us, and though we can never know one another's face or voice, yours, Martino. This is not only networking among the sick, this is also networking among literary women. Ellen Mears once explained that Victorian women writers, most of whom were denied the opportunity to meet in person in literary circles, so men had literary circles, women tried for a very short time, but it didn't work. So they needed letters, they needed their written communication to forge these networks. And it also, she sought to create a sense of um, literary community by reading other people's books. And through the book, they constructed an intense familiarity with the respective authors. Therefore, this networking through the medium of the book was an alternative attempt to form a female literary society. 
So it's not the, only this fellowship among sufferers, but it also starts to become a fellowship of women. Okay, that was um, a bit of a detailed reading of um, the preface to understand how she creates this um, networked isolation, that she's not really alone, but she is in a community with others, even though these might be far away. Um, what I now want to look at are um, some specific objects that are important in her isolation of the sick room um, because they connect her to others. One is a bit problematic, but the other, I think, um, is maybe not. The first one is the telescope. So far, we have seen how Martino relates private and public spheres and how she constantly relates moments of retreat, but also feelings of confinement, so prisoner to the couch, with opening up and extending the small private sphere through identification with her fellow sufferers, by reaching out to her readers and by forging a joint experience with another sick person, her unnamed dedicatee. And we have taken a glimpse at her huge powers of imagination. It is this imagination that allows her to go anywhere, at least mentally, no matter how narrow and depressive her confinement might be. There are two kinds of objects that play an important role in this context, which I want to discuss in some detail. The first one is the telescope, and the other one are travel books. Martineau perceived her sick room not only as a welcome retreat, but also as a recess of illness, whose inhabitants Mm, she referred to as the sick and the sequestered. However, the felt claustrophobia that resonates in these terms is conquered by Martineau through the frequent use of her telescope, which carries the spirit of the sick prisoner abroad into the open air and among people. When I shut down my window, I feel that my mind has had an airing, so she cannot go for a walk while she uses her telescope to do so visually. Literary critic Lucy Bender pointedly summarizes the role of the telescope for Martineau's sick room experience. Quote, Even within the enclosing walls of the sick room, Martineau insists on her ability to escape and to move beyond the physical containment of the room in ways that are epitomized by the use of a highly prized telescope that allowed her to spy into the houses and gardens of her neighbors. And to quote Martineau, see the gay crowds that throng the opposite shore after church. The telescope allows the patient a wider freedom, however mediated. Inspired by Donna Herrera's work on the post-human, I began to think of Martineau's telescope as prophecies. And there we need the next slide. Okay. Prophesis denotes um, addition or extension, and is usually understood as an artificial mediator between amputation and extension. The OED defines prosthetics as the branch of surgery concerned with the replacement of absent parts of the body by artificial substitutes. So when Martineau went to the sick room, it's not that she has lost a leg or lost an arm or anything, nothing was amputated, but what she has lost is actually um, a certain environment and her freedom to enjoy this environment. And she is very limited in her space and where she can go. And thus you can think of this telescope um, as a prosthetic means that actually allows her to regain um, what is amputated. Um, and this is taking part in other people's lives, being outside. The telescope as a device or a medium that allows for the virtual extension, not of her body, but of her space. In his seminal text, Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man, Marshall McLuhan has used the concept of prophecies to explain media's function as an extension of ourself. So, for example, he argues that wheels are an extension of um, our feet or um, our clothes are an extension of our skin. The telescope is an extension of her eyes that allows for a virtual compensation of the reduced, amputated and narrowed down living environment and she has to accept which she has to accept during her illness. Yet, for a person for whom privacy is of enormous importance, it is very careless 
with her, um, well, she's very careless with her neighbor's rights for privacy, actually. Martineau, who lived in an age of many technical invention states, and here we need the next transparency. And this is interesting because these um, technical inventions in her age were, of course, I mean, before cameras, before photography, or no, maybe started a bit later. But of course, um, before all this digital spheres and the internet that we are afraid of today because um, they might endanger our privacy. She says, we all know how the present action of our new civilization works to the impairing of privacy. As new discoveries are um, causing all penetrating physical lights so to abound as that, as has been said, we shall soon not know where in the world to bet any darkness. So our new facilities for every sort of communication work to reduce privacy much within its former limits. It is to be hoped that the privacy of viva voci communication will never remain sac will ever remain sacred. But it is known that that which are to be as holy, that of epistolary correspondence, the private conversation of distant friends, is constant and deliberately violated where there are certain inducements to do so. So privacy is very important for her. And because we have now the penny post in Britain, she's very afraid that putting her words into letters, people who are not the recipients of these letters might actually read them. And to have light and electricity everywhere and no retreat into darkness is a big issue for her. It seems hard to believe that Martino, who is so concerned about her own privacy and her letters would never consider her surreptitious observation-based intrusion of her neighbor's Christmas parties and Sunday walks as a violation of privacy. This is what she just does because she likes it and she sees no problem there. Fortunately, the second prosthetic device, which allows her to leave the isolating sick room, at least mentally, is less problematic. To extend and expand her limited or amputated possibilities to engage with the wider world are books, specifically travel books. She tells her readers that travel books provide the chamber dwellers, the involuntary plodders within narrow bounds with the opportunity to get, quote, out of their prison for holiday. And she further raves, to us, travel is scenery, exercise, fresh air. One writer whom she explicitly praises is Christopher North. And here we need the next transparency. Okay. It's a pseudonym for the Scottish intellectual um, John Wilson. And she says, whether he thought of us or not, he has recreated us, open our prison doors, and let us a long flight over mountain and moor, lake and lea, and dropped us again on our beds, refreshed and soothed, to dream at least of having felt the long lost sensation of health once more. Eventually, Martineau does not even need a textual description to imagine travelling. No, it suffices to see the Union Jack, to see in a moment the peaks of Sulitelme, or of the Ants, or tropical sands, or chilly pine forests spread before me, or palmy West Indian groves. So just the image of the Union Jack is now enough for her, and she can imagine all this world of travel. The sufferer cannot go in bodily presence on such journeys outside the sick room, and yet driven by the power of ideas, this is a removal in thought from the sick room is possible. So her imagination is the next strength or resource or potential for her to actually leave isolation and experience freedom. Martino undoubtedly values the advantages of her retiring into the privacy of her sick room and time out. It gives her the opportunity to keep people out and to claim her time as her own in ways that had been impossible to her in public life. Yet her sick room is also perceived as a prison. But this prison can be shaped and there are some prophetic and imaginative means to allow her to take a holiday from it. As Lucy Bender has pointedly expressed, Martineau depicts her sick room as a physically realized space with firmly demarcated, yet strangely elastic walls that both imprison the patient and yet allow a wider freedom. Martineau herself put it as follows. When our sentence is passed, the next thing is to make it as lenient as possible in its operation. 
So she knows how to shape her sacrum. Um, we will not talk because we want some time for questions about her experiences with mesmerism um, and the experience that maybe healed her, at least after these experiences, she got well again. Um, but she was also um, very much ridiculed because of this. So her brother-in-law, who was a physician, a more or less traditional physician, of course, didn't like the idea that um, his sister-in-law would tell the world that she's actually healed through mesmerism, especially as this practice was not um, done by experts, but by her own housemates. Um, so it's a kind of hyp um, hypnosis that we can see on the next transparency. And however this happens, um, she was very open towards um, non-traditional medicine. And this is also a time in medicine where we have a certain shift. So um, it was only um, in those days that there was a specific um, health act published that actually helped people to differentiate between who is a real physician and who is not. Um, so this mesmerism wouldn't have been practiced um, some 10 years later, but Martino had it practiced on her, not only by um, specialists, but by these women who helped in her household. And she got better and better and better. And from nowadays view, we know that this can happen with this kind of illness that she had. And she thought that she was healed by mesmerism. And her brother-in-law was really cruel because he published not in a Latin um, journal for um, physicians, but in an English journal that everybody could afford. Um, every detail about her illness um, and ridiculed her and, um, well, talked about every part of the body, about her uterus, about her menstrual circle, um, so just everything. And so this vulnerability that she always experienced um, and was afraid of when she would open up and become this public person um, that actually um, very much affected her because her brother-in-law, um, well, talked and published in this way about her experiences with mesmerism and about her illness as such. Um, and I suggest that he had specific problems with her healing because it was not done by an expert and not done by a man and not done by traditional medicine. After her recovery, Martino built a new home for herself in Ambleside, where she became a neighbor of Wordsworth and Matthew Arnold. She continued to write and publish, to travel and to cultivate her friendships through letter writing. And then a decade later, in 1855, she had to return to the sick room. And she created for herself the perfect hospice managed by her nieces and devoted maidservants who wrote letters at her dictation and filtered the flow of sometimes unwanted visitors. So by the time she died in 1876, Valerie Saunders suggests, she had made her invalidism into a profession, a fine art through which she had won freedom. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe some small comments about what does that say about isolation and the sick room and being ill and this Victorian woman writer. I consider Martineau as an expert on the ambivalences of isolation, and I hope that some of these ambivalences have become clear today. Martineau's life and work, as well as her writing about her life, reflect the extent to which writing for the public opens up pathways out of domestic isolation and gendered imprisonment. Yet her life story shows how vulnerable this entry into the public sphere rendered her experience and existence as a Victorian woman. Infamous reviews of her political economy attempted to isolate and exclude her from the area of publishing by stressing her unfemale behavior and opinions. Later, her brother-in-law, by revealing the results of the examination of her internal organs to the public, exposes her and her illness and destroys the well-guarded privacy that she tried to establish during her tenement of years. Martineau enjoyed solitude, but she fought against confinement. She travels, not only to discover the world, but also to be able to be alone. She takes refuge in chrono and heterotopias, times and spaces available at the margins of the social, the sick room, the night, the early morning, and distant places that follow a different code of behavior places where she can be free, aloof from the behavioral rules and expectations of family and the Victorian public. 
Her language and her metaphors reveal the dynamics of isolation, the tension between prison and retreat, between exposure and privacy. They occupied her for a lifetime. Phrases such as leaving my shell or open plains express her desire for freedom and her will to take part in and build public life. What I hardly find in Martineau's repertoire of isolation experiences are expressions of loneliness. Even though she constantly defends her solitude, she almost always considers herself part of a group. Whether it is her fellow sufferers or simply Victorian women, such as her pan poll Florence Nightingale and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, she knows herself to be part of a network and those who must fight for the public recognition, but whose voice is becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. Women that fight the confines of society through the power of language and the force of their imagination. And this is, I think, how Martineau dealt as a Victorian writer and woman and invalid with the ambivalences of isolation. Okay, thank you. Powerful. Thank you very much. Um, that was extremely interesting. Thanks a whole lot. That was very nice. I see a lot of clapping hands there in the background. So people Thank you. profited from this. And I'm very happy that you introduced me to a, a new person, a new writer who I had known, um, uh, who's addressing a lot of interesting questions that I've discussed in other contexts uh, and, and, and invites all kinds of exciting uh, comparisons. The microphone is open. I think it would also be very interesting for me. Who knew Harriet Martineau before this lecture? So could you show hands? <laughs> Nobody. That's interesting. Yeah. Maybe because the writing is not that literary. Ah, okay. As to fold this. Okay, is, is there anybody who is uh, who has a comment to make or a question to ask? Right? Um, I see Maria has her hand up. That sounds like a hand that wants to ask something. But Mike can go first if you want, um, because we raise it at the same time. Mike, do you want to go first? Um, doesn't matter. Well, make up your mind. <laughs> Um, okay, I just want to ask why she went there. If she sees it or saw it as her prison, why would she even go there? I mean, she had the possibility to stay at home and still she decided to go to a sick room. Uh, what were the conditions there? Why would you go somewhere? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the question. I think um, the reason might be that she um, hadn't a home anymore because um, she went traveling and then she had to, um, well, stop traveling because of this illness, because she felt unwell. And then she went to the household of her sister. And um, usually it would be like that, that if somebody is sick, you stay with family. So this was not her home, but one of her closest relatives. So, and her brother-in-law was even a physician. So she, it was logical. Um, and the way how it should be done in Victorian society that she just went to her sister's house and then she will be cared for. But to be cared for very often also means that you cannot make your own decisions. So if there are people who want to visit you, you have to be polite. Um, your nieces and sister and brother-in-law or whoever might come into your room. And I think this is actually a very valuable comment that she makes that because of pain, you can't always be friendly. And maybe sometimes you do not want others to experience um, how you are in these moments and hours and maybe days when you have pain. You want to decide when you want to see somebody and when not. And I think it's also just um, that you can't decide on many things. So not on your meals and maybe not on the view you have out of your window, which seems to be so very important for her. And she was, of course, lucky because she had the money to afford um, to have her own household. So it's not, she spent most of the time in her sick room, but it was in her house that was managed by her servants who cooked what she wanted and who allowed the visitors in that she wanted to come in. 
I think it's um, because she wanted to be to have agency, even though she is sick. And this is something that would have been very difficult in the household of her sister and brother-in-law, because then the man would decide and the woman would have to accept, possibly, I think. Does that answer your question, Mary? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so, Anna, thank you. <laughs> this was this was excellent, like, so well conceptualized. I love the readings. Um, so I have many things that, that came to mind or that I was, would be interested in asking you, but I think sort of the most um, maybe maybe interesting to, to ask right now is um, if you could comment on the ways that literary form matters to your understanding of network isolation. If there's, if you can connect this, or I mean, these, this is an autobiography. You talked about letters and, and communication and the telescope. So that is, of course, all um, a very specific literary form. And then in your other work, it sounds like you're also working on, on fictional narratives and how that sort of ties in there. So I'd love to hear more about that. Um, and then, yeah, maybe also because you had to cut yourself short with the with the mesmerism, um, but like that is very interesting to me as well. So is mesmerism in this instance just another a synonym of of hypnosis? Is that what we're talking about here? And how would you read hypnosis through your lens of isolation? Is is hypnosis wow. something that's related to isolation? Is she sort of retreating into herself and is more isolated? Or is this breaking out of isolation because you need another person as someone like to be, <laughs> to, to have an hypnosis or to watch you? So yeah, so these are two very different things, literary form and tell us more about mesmerism. Thank you. Okay. Um, I never thought about um, the relationship between um, hypnosis and isolation. Um, though, of course, mesmerism relies, it is it is similar to hypnosis. There is an Austrian physician, his name is Andreas Mesmer. Oh, it's Franz Anton Mesmer. Um, and he was the first to make experience with this. And it is a mixture between hypnosis, but also putting hands on somebody. And of course, this is um, the opposite of isolation because it very much works with something happens between you and me and they thought it has to do with a certain kind of magnetism um so there must be different kinds of energies that move from you to me and these can actually heal you i'm not an expert in met on mesmerism at all um but this is the basic idea so it's of course um well it's there is nothing about isolation, but it's all about relation and even physical touch and um, stuff like that. Um, form is, of course, um, very important if you think about isolation, though um, maybe in Harriet Martineau, it's, um, it's a less literary developed and sophisticated work, maybe, because she's also very much in journalism. Um, so you can't find so many uh, literary forms and devices that are interesting. And this is why I spend so much time with this preface, because I think this framing, um, like this is not just my book that I'm writing to people who won't understand because they are not sick, maybe. But this is actually a conversation and a dialogue. I write in the knowledge of another sick person, of a fellow sufferer. Um, and I think this framing does very much with regard to... Um, well, creating and building um, a connection and a community, while usually this act of writing a book and talking about your own self is very can be very narcissistic and very focused on one person and a very um, isolated endeavor of one autonomous person who thinks he or she is important. But this is what she does not do. But through this framing, she is always imagining herself in a community with others and also protected by this little dialogic sphere um, and also by this um, specific knowledge that she always um, references, like we know how it is and the others might not. So if there are any critical reviews or any people who are critical of this book, be careful because you belong to those who do not know while we know. So this is, of course, a very, well, um, clever strategy, maybe. 
but it also has to do something with literary form, so how you frame um, your book. Um, and yeah, I'm thinking about different examples. So, for example, the first um, example I deal with from the 17th century is the Renaissance text of um, Robert Burton, An Anatomy of Melancholy. And this is very interesting in terms of form because um, he has all these isolated vignettes, so it's not just a connected text, but this text is open everywhere because he references the whole world because it's a very, very thick volume because he wants to find and write and include in this book everything that he can find about the condition of melancholy. So he looks at a lot of um, ancient authors um, and also medieval authors. And he also writes a little bit about himself. He writes about medicine. He writes about, um, well, witchcraft, just everything he can get. So this text has um, an endless amount of references and openings. So the text is a palimpsest or um, it is a conglomerate that is not really his text, but his text is made of the knowledge and the text of others. So it is a deeply um, relational work already while he um, Burton sits in his Oxford study and is totally isolated from the world and he has a first edition no not good enough he wants more sources he has a second edition he has a third edition he had the fourth edition he had the fifth edition he had the sixth edition and then he dies and the book grows and grows and grows and grows and his isolation also grows and grows and grows and grows because he does nothing else as a scholar it seems but the book is his dialogue um, with other times and other people and other experts. Um, and this is what you can also see in the form of the book, this vast thing with endless references. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is one example that just came to my mind. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Overcoming isolation by reading uh, it can be difficult sometimes, but also rewarding. I have a question by Clarissa. Yes, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that M Martino lived in an age of many technical inventions. Um, also that well, inventions that were seen as reducing privacy. And my question is, what do you think her thoughts regarding today's media situation would be and also how that affects our privacy today? Okay. Um, so if I answered your correct your question correctly, how she would think about other current media situation and what this does to our connectedness or privacy? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think she will be shocked because um, I had this one um, quote where she talks about that she wouldn't like to imagine that others read her letters or that people open letters that um, shouldn't be seen with them and stuff like that. Um, and I think this very idea that um, everything you do um, digitally or everything you write or all photos that ever go into the digital world um, can maybe, and most of us just don't know exactly, be found and used and um, whatever by other people um, would be a shock to her. But I mean, this is normal because she is this lady from the 19th century um, who even thought that electricity and letter writing um, is very problematic because people want their darkness and um, people want to control who reads what they write. Mm. Yes, and of course, because she is who she is, she would actually shape that situation. I don't know how, but I think she would think about ways how she would not be determined or um, be subject to these developments, but she would find ways to um, to shape her privacy um, and would encourage us to do so. Um, though I can't say what she would say. But I mean, she she is one of those persons who you think, oh, poor, poor girl, something like that. And then she comes up, well, I'm not a poor girl. This puts me into new opportunities and I'll actually make use of it. She, I think this is a little bit the sense that I have of her. 
um, that she wouldn't just say something like be careful, but she would say things like, okay, get informed, know how it works. And then, well, you decide what happens to your data or you fight for it that you will be the one who decides. This is my impression of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Perfect. Wonderful. We've had a good conversation today, I think. That was really nice. That was really nice. You know, I've been thinking about uh, Thomas Mann at Sauberberg as well, mm -hmm. you know, which has to do with isolation yeah. and sickness and all that. So there's, it's a, these are topics that are all over the place. Yeah. They're, yes, they're very, you. very, very important. Consumption, of course, 19th century is the mm -hmm. century of consumption. Um, um, and, and so you have a lot of these sick people. As an Americanist, I've been thinking about invalids in American literature because you have all of these people after the Civil War mm. who have, a, you know, who, who lost an arm or a leg. Okay. Uh, and and, and there, there's a quite a lot of, just the figure of the invalid um, appears in a lot of stories and is extremely extremely important um, not only in the sense of the subject who you know has to cope with suffering and all that mm -hmm. but also as a a person who is stressful you know it's just when they when they're in pain yeah. they become a pain <laughs> and so it's, it's also a, a a difficult character you know a character that is tyrannizing all the relatives because they can't walk so you have to they constantly scream and call you and you have to work for them and things like that mm -hmm. so it's, it's it's quite interesting but i've never found a a master student who wanted to write a, a master thesis on on some of these invalid figures and i think they're very interesting yes too bad <laughs> certainly they they certainly they also maybe are to a certain kind ambivalent figures right Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say that, you know, your, your medical approach is more sort of in the, the empathy direction, but mm -hmm. I, I think there's also a lot of literature where people, uh, suffer from invalid, uh, um, fathers who terrorize the family or, or just relatives. Mm -hmm. or, have you ever read Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton? No, no, I haven't, but it rings a bell. Interesting story. Mm -hmm. okay. It's also about a man who has an in, an invalid wife and and everybody, and she's terrorizing the family. And then he has a young nurse um, who basically, um, you know, takes care of her. And then they have an affair. And that's, of course, bad. And they decide to commit suicide um, to sled against a tree. And then they both survive. And now they are invalids and the lady who used to be an invalid and terrorized them is now nursing them and taking care of them and enjoying the power over them. You know, it's, it's a very nasty, typical Edith Wharton story, I think. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah very, yeah. very interesting perspective. So th there are lots of interesting, as you said, ambivalent angles sometimes to this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Shall we call it a day if nobody else wants the floor? And can I, in the name of everybody who listened, thank you very much. Um, that was a Someone has a their hand raised. Presentation. Somebody had their hand up. Yes, yes, I see 274 has her hand up, please. <laughs> thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, you mentioned that she was fighting for the rights of the sick. Do we know whether she was read by Nightingale, whether her writings um, changed something in, in, you know, the treatment of, of sick people, how they designed maybe uh, hospital rooms or mm -hmm. I don't know, retreats? Mm -hmm. um, actually, she exchanged letters with Nightingale, so they were kind of pen pulls. Um, I don't know if they ever met, but they were in contact while they're writing. And I think haven't um well i haven't gone into that more deeply but i think that there are articles and even books about um how these two ladies um well um changed the view on sickness and i think um this um 
Life in the Sick Room that I just talked about has really been um, eye-opening for many because there was actually an invalid who was talking about um, how important it is to actually have a view and stuff like that. And this is maybe a very privileged um, view, of, well, on sickness. But I think that Nightingale changed a lot of these things um, in those years that she actually tried to make nice environments um, for the sick. And I think you'll find articles on this, but I haven't gone more deeply into this. But you, you could, and I'm rather sure that there is an influence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you too. Fantastic. Good question. Yes. Okay, then. Um, next week, is it Philipp Schweighauser? I'm trying to look at my program. I think it's Philipp Schweighauser. No, it's, it's, no, it's, it's me. Maria next week. Next ah, week is Maria and Philipp is after her. Sorry, you're even here. Thank you for objecting. And it's going to be Louisa May Alcock, which is, of course, always wonderful to, to hear about. That's going to be great. And thank you for being with us. And thank you for being with us next week. Um, let's repeat again, if you um, didn't get an extra invitation this time, you just use the old link, don't erase it, and you can basically um, um, connect um, to next week's session. So, um, same, same time next week, Thursday, um, 6 o'clock in the evening. Um, thank you for being here, for listening, and I look forward to... Um, seeing as many of you next time. We have 25. That's a serious number. That's wonderful. Excellent. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.